I'm Ann Darden. Um, I'm delighted to be back in Lincoln. Um, I have a lot of happy memories of, of Lincoln. I got my PhD here in English um, about three and a half years ago and still have a lot of friends and uh, some family here. Um, I'm presently um, assistant professor in English at Central Michigan University. Um, Michigan has always kind of been my home too. And so I think I have the best of, of all possible worlds at this, at, at this point. I'm going to read for you today um, selections from the manuscript for a novel that I've written. And um, since I'm going to be reading, I just pulled selections out of the novel, and since I'm going to be reading uh, various kind of disconnected sections, I've written um, a little introduction for you that I hope will give you a sense of the context and the characters so you can follow the, um, the action. Namesake, a poetic novel. Namesake is a work in three parts which examines in poetry and prose the life of one woman in relationship to others, especially her mother. Through her writing, the woman named Jane for her mother, Sarah Jane, sets out on a journey of self-discovery, a quest for mother, God, self, home. Jane, in effect, writes herself into being. The frame for part one is a long letter that Jane, a woman of 40, writes to Johnny, her 20-year-old lover. As Jane writes, she slips into drafts of poems, journal entries, dreams, and sessions with her therapist, who is also named John. The frame for part two is loosely a play, maybe more properly a series of scenes detailing Jane's search for her mother through the voices of others. Perhaps part two could be called a chorus of voices. The frame for part three is a long traveling poem which roams over the scenes of Jane's life. The poem is addressed to Miguel, Jane's lover, who is supposed to be teaching her Spanish, but who has gone to Spain instead to write his novel. Other characters who figure prominently in Jane's story are Will and Fanny, Jane's brother and sister, Skip, Jane's husband, Carrie, Emily, and Drew, Jane's children, Marilyn Rogers, Jane's dear friend in Michigan, members of Sarah Jane's family, the Burns family, to be introduced later, and some of Jane's assorted lovers. Two places that are especially important to the novel are the old Victorian home in Illinois, where Jane was raised, and the family's summer cottage in Michigan. Prominent themes include Jane's blindness of eye and heart, her feeling of being abandoned, and her need to heal herself. As Jane grows, the writing grows. The work begins in confusion and panic and ends with a long, triumphant poem. The reader witnesses the novel taking shape under Jane's fingers. Selections from part one, the letter to Johnny. Why can't I see? Bleeding eyes. She was born into a broken world, her mother's face a cracked Picasso, her hands claws with bent fingers. She was born into a nightmare world, every clock with two faces screaming at each other. She was born into a circus world. Dogs on severed legs jumped through jagged hoops. She was born into a shadow world. Victorian staircase, a journey into doom. Canopy bed, an island surrounded by sharks. And when she dropped this world, the pieces flew into a kaleidoscope of orange and blue, slicing her eyes. And when she dropped, shit, can't finish anything. She was born into a hollow world. Her father's footsteps echo shouting from a well, his voice bouncing against her walls. She was born into a lonely, nasi solitario, solitario a un en utro. Shit, I'm losing my Spanish because I'm not using it and there's something horrible wrong with my eyes and all I can think about is death. Dear Johnny, when I see your sensitive face, my hands reach out to touch it, to comfort you before I even know whether that's what you want. I see the longing in your eyes and I want to satisfy that longing before I even know what it is for. I read myself into you and then want to feed you instead of myself. If I don't feed me, who will? Am I so wrong about you? Do you have the same hungers I do? Am I reading my hungers into you because your face reminds me of my mother's face because I couldn't make her happy and so I am driven to make everyone else happy who reminds me of her? 
because I fall in love with everyone who reminds me of her. My dreams were all mixed up. I, I kept waking up thinking of you. First I was in a house, enormous, unknown. I've never seen it before. I was there with everybody but Skip and Emily, and I felt happy, contented. Then Emily came with tons of clothes and belongings, filling up the house, cluttering it, and she kept talking and talking. My ears ached, and I wanted to scream at her to be quiet. I couldn't think for the sound of her voice. She wanted too many things, and I couldn't give them to her, and it was driving me crazy because I wanted to give them to her. Then Skip appeared with the new baby I had just had and abandoned. He made me feel so guilty I took both of them in, but I didn't want to, and so I felt used and resentful. By now the house was such a mess that I knew I'd never get it in order again. It was hopeless, and I felt helpless and trapped. People kept coming in, and I didn't know any of them, and they were boorish like Skip's political friends were, and I didn't want them around, but I didn't know how to get rid of them. All of a sudden, there you were. I was out of the house and alone in some place I can't remember. It was quiet and grassy. But I don't know where it was. When I saw you, I felt a tremendous relief, like I had come home after a long journey. That makes no sense. I have no home. Yes, I do. Michigan. Now I'm confused and have forgotten the rest of the dream. When Carrie was born, I felt wonderful, like I'd done something worthwhile for the first time in my life. She was beautiful, perfect. Her head wasn't squished in like most newborn babies. Everyone in the hospital made a fuss over her. She was the first girl born in that hospital, and she was so beautiful. Everyone said they'd never seen such a beautiful baby. And every time I looked at her or held her, it was like a miracle. I did this. Little, dumb, homely, pitiful Janie had this exquisite baby with ten perfect fingers and ten perfect tiny curled-up toes and a pug nose and not a blemish on her perfect pink skin. And I could never get enough of touching her and holding her and biting her toes and looking in her gray-blue eyes and running my finger over her soft, soft cheeks, which made her suck and desperately wanting to feed her and not being able to. Of course, I couldn't even do that right and hold her all the time and being scared when they took her away for fear it was all a dream and not being able to stand to hear her cry and not being able to feed her, never able to feed her. Mommy falling down the stairs again, brittle bag of bones. Oh, why doesn't she break, break, break? Mommy, my doll is broken again. Kiss it and make it well, never well again. Mommy, don't leave me. I knew it was a mistake as soon as I saw the hotel. It was old and genteel, run down like it belonged to another era. Dad had probably had some nice times there and as usual was trying to do the right thing for me, but also as usual, didn't know anything about me and what I really needed or wanted. I realize now, when it is too late, it's always too late, that he was just as baffled by me as I was scared of him. What did he know about raising girls, especially one as shy and sickly and strange as I was? Now, Fanny could talk his language, so he had no trouble raising her, and she adored him. Meanwhile, back at the hotel, here was this little, shy, scared girl woman getting out of her car, her father's car at that, smart, checkered, Marsha Field suit and navy blue velvet hat, spilling rice all over the sidewalk, while her red-headed football player groom tried to look nonchalant, carrying in her grandfather Burns' old black box suitcases. When the fat man in the lobby started whistling, here comes the bride, she wanted to curl up and die. What was she doing in this dump with a stranger whose name she now bore? What would they do? What would they ever have to talk about? How could she climb the stairs when her legs had turned to water? What had she been thinking of? Her periods had just started and now she was going to spend the night with this man? Her mother couldn't bring herself to tell her child about sanitary napkins. Her doctor uncle didn't have nerve enough to give her a premarital exam. She'd never even read a book about sex. None of her boyfriends had ever touched her, and now she was going to be in bed with this man all night long. She'd never slept in a bed with anyone else, even her sister. Every man wants a virgin. What would he do to her? She wanted to run, but where could she go? He had her father's keys. He had her grandfather's suitcases. He had her name. Where could she go? The bellhop took the suitcases and he took her arm, and she followed along like a zombie. Good old spot, see spot run, see spot chase the ball, see dick pat spot on the head. 
see Jane play with her doll, see Dick play ball with the boys, see Jane in the kitchen cooking, see Jane cleaning the house, see Jane in the bedroom bleeding. Every man wants a virgin. Mommy, don't leave me. The room was tiny with one double bed. It was stifling hot, windows closed, Venetian blinds and gauzy curtains, chipped furniture and green institutional rug, flowered bedspread, don't just stand there, tip the bell hop, tell him to open the window, no, no, leave it closed. What will he do? Take off his clothes, take off mine, I'm sick, I'm gonna throw up. Nice girls don't throw up on their honeymoon. I have to go to the bathroom, will he let me go? Unpack suitcases, white nighty. I never had a nighty before. Always slept in pajamas, pajamas, pajamas. I want my mommy. Go in the bathroom and change. He says, go in the bathroom and change. Who is this man? Is he the same one who kneeled at the altar with me a few hours ago, or was it days or years? Go in the bathroom, put on white nighty, use the toilet, stuff it with paper so he can't hear, wipe yourself carefully, open the door, walk out, thank God he turned the lights off, get into bed, let him touch your face. You always liked him to touch your face and kiss your eyes like they do in the movies, every man wants a virgin. Let him touch all those places no one else has ever touched. Not you, not your mother, not your doctor, no one, no one, no one, stop trembling. He won't kill you. Isn't this what you wanted? No, no, no. I wanted the movies. I wanted my dreams. I just wanted someone, anyone to love me. I didn't want this. I want to be a virgin. It hurts. You promised you'd hold my hand. You lied to me. You promised I hate you. It hurts. Blood all over the bed. Blood on my white nighty. Don't let them kill me. Mental diarrhea, emotional diarrhea, who would want to read it? Crap, 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 catharsis, mental anima, emotional anima, help, help, I'm trapped in a fortune cookie factory. Where is a shoulder to cry on? Can't cry on my own. Pinch me, mommy, slap me, mommy, I have years and years of tears and tears. I'm a poet and don't know it. Cinderella, dressed in yellow, tried her best to get a fella. How many fellas did she get? One, two, three, four, step on a crack, break your mother's back. Cinderella, dressed in red, tried to get the boys in bed. How many fellas did she get? Five, six, seven, eight. Dear God, don't let me lose count. Cinderella, dressed in blue, found she only wanted you. How many fellas did she get? Nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Every man wants a virgin. Tom, kind, caring, making a sacrament of food, giving himself to me, opening me up to myself, a quiet pool to float in, a receptacle to fill a well to sink into. Love is in giving, in serving, in knowing. Long, sensitive fingers, kind face, gentle wit, open, intimate. Joel, gentle, powerful emotions beneath a placid surface. Touch, electric fingers, passion like a dance. Fingers stroke in perfect rhythm, mouths, tongues, ballet on bodies, breath in harmony, no words. Rob, all fire, consuming himself, scared, lonely, a rabbit freezing in fear, twitching, running, an actor, bluffing his way through life. Brown eyes full of pain, melt me, need so deep, feed me, touch me, hold me, make me feel alive. Take away the panic. Dawn, silence. Deep water bathing me in peace. Silent pine in a wood of weeping willows. Tough muscles touch tenderness. Strong hands absorb pain. Hard body comforts. Heels freeze. Johnny, love. Longing eyes, yearning fingertips, recognition. My eyes and his sockets, my mouth and his bones, born out of the same womb two decades apart. Siamese twins in another life, separated here by radical surgery. 
bearing our secret incisions alone, desperate touch makes us whole again for a moment. Sudden satisfaction, a complete surprise. Continuing the letter to Johnny from Michigan. I took the Rogers to the outlet, or rather they took me. I'd never been there before in all the years I've been coming up here. Will always takes his children there when he comes up north. It's a wonderful place with a dam, a waterfall, and a drainage tunnel filled with swirling water the kids ride on, coast on like a wet, bouncy, buoyant, slippery slide. The kids were all yelling and whooping in delight, so I took out my contacts and plugged up my ears and went down to join them. One look inside that tunnel and I panicked, no way am I going in there. I get claustrophobia in elevators, in closets, in my office with no window, under too many covers at night, when I have a cold and can't breathe through my nose, no way am I going in that dark tunnel filled with water. I swam down to the waterfall and stood in it for a while, then floated back to the tunnel. Marilyn had been through a couple of times and she hollered, it's like being born. I hollered back, I'm chicken. She said, just go in head first and kind of walk on your hands. Stand up as soon as you get through so you won't hit the rocks. It's not the rocks that bother me, it's that long, dark tunnel. Come on, Jane, it's like being born. I watched the kids go through and come out the other side. Then I put my hands down into the rushing water and let the current carry me right into the tunnel. And I whooped, wow, it is fun. A man was standing there catching his kids as they came through and I said to him, the only way to overcome a fear is to do the thing you're afraid of. Janie, the friendly old philosopher, it's like being born. The train whistle reminds me of my childhood, so haunting, so far away. Dad would pile us in the car and we'd go to the old fashioned drugstore on the corner and he'd buy us a double dip ice cream cone. I always got chocolate, Will always got vanilla. We'd watch them scoop out the hard packed ice cream, pushing our noses against the frosty glass, breath coming from the ice cream like our breaths on a cold morning. My upper lip was always sweaty. Carrie's was too when she was little. And the cold glass felt so good. Once when Drew was a baby, I bundled all the kids up in snowsuits to go out and play and asked the big ones to watch Drew for a minute while I ran inside. And Drew came screaming into the house, his tongue bleeding. He'd touch the iron railing with his tongue to see what it would feel like. God, he's my child. No one can tell me anything either. And I was mad at the other kids for not watching him. Good Lord, what did I think they could do? No one could ever do anything with Drew. God love him, he's my child. Flesh of my flesh, bone of my bone. Then we'd carry our cones back to the hot box of a car balancing them above our heads while our tongues reached up to lick them before they dripped all over us. Mom always stayed in the car and never got a cone. She just sat and smoked. I hated getting back in that car full of smoke. To this day, I can't ride in a car when anyone is smoking without wanting to vomit. Dad would get behind the wheel, licking his cone too, and then he'd say, everything under control? And we'd chorus, yes. And then he'd look at his watch and say, time for the Zephyr, start the car, and we'd drive to the tracks just in time to watch the Silver Street diesel-powered streamlined Zephyr whiz by on its way to Chicago, glorious Chicago, where Dad sneaked off to hold court and Mom went to visit Annie Jo, Grand Chicago where Annie Jo took us to see the 10-story Christmas tree at Marshall Fields. Fanny was always the last one done with her cone, licking her lips daintily as a cat licks its whiskers, even though she had held the cone out the window and melted it all over everyone, and Mom was mad at her for making a mess. Nobody could ever stay mad at Fanny very long, though. She was so beautiful, so beautiful and poised. Besides, she was the only one who knew how to touch Mom. She would get Mom to rub her back. None of the rest of us knew how to touch her. Now some selections from part two, uh, sort of a chorus of, of voices. Oh, let my lies tell the truth. I gently lifted her off my back and carried her in my arms. I carry you in my arms, in my hands, in my bones, in my blood, in my heart, in my mind, in my alma, in my corazón, in mis manos, in mis brazos, ni in mi espalda, not on my back anymore, ever again. Nunca me lleve nada, never again. Todos mis madres, all my mothers, 
All the way up, I kept hearing the trees rub together, making the eeriest kind of music. Oh, why did I never learn anything about music? Why did I always believe the lies everyone told about me? Jane, you're too shy to play the piano. I kept walking through the brush, listening, watching. The woods are so tall, no sun ever gets down to the floor, and the branches don't start growing until my neck aches to see them. Finally, I got to the clearing and burst out into the sunlight. I stood and turned my face to the sun. It was warm and quiet. The wind was no longer moaning, just a whisper far off, and all I could hear were the bees. The trumpet bushes. Oh, why did I never learn anything about wildflowers? Same problem with the Spanish. Jane, you're too slow to learn Spanish. The trumpet bushes smelled so sweet I felt lightheaded. Where? Where is the spot? Where did I bury her? Here, under the trees, next to the sweet bushes. Oh, Mommy, now I'm going to bury little Janie with you. She was a sweet kid, really nice and good and stronger than I ever thought, but I want to be free of her, too. She was scared of everything and everyone, shy, crying whenever she saw something or someone she hadn't seen before. I didn't realize she couldn't see. I would have had more compassion for her. I hated her. She could never do anything right. She was always humiliating me. She couldn't talk or stand up straight or catch a ball or run without falling or play without bumping into something. She was dumb and blind and clumsy and I hated her. There's room for her here too, Mommy. And you can hold her through all eternity and she will never cry again. And you can love each other at last and no one will see you or care. No one will make fun of you or tease you or call you a sissy. And I cried and took her off my back and carried her in my arms and put her beside her mother. And I prayed, oh, mother of us all, take care of them both. And I stood and felt the sun. All my mothers. I don't know any of my mothers. No one knew my mother. Her mother died before I was born. Dad's mother died before I was grown. No one ever talked about any of my mothers. I don't know them. Who were they? What did they do? What were their names? Where are my mothers? Is it too late to find them? And I took them off my back and carried them in my arms. I carry you in my arms, in my hands, in my bones, in my blood, in mis huesos, in mis restos, in mi sangre, in mi mente, in mi animo, in mi alma, in mi corazón, in mis manos, in mis brazos, in mi voz, in mi, mis palabras, in my voice, and in my words. Gracias, Mama. Gracias, lastimosa Juanita. Thank you, all you faceless, nameless mothers, for birth, for bravery, for endurance. I give you life. I give it back. You speak through my voice. You live in my bones. My words bring you to life once more. Speak. Scene, soap opera. Cast, Senator Charles F. Burns and daughters, Dolly, Maggie, and Sarah Jane, Jane's mother. Dolly, Papa, how was your trip? Did you talk with Senator Green? Do you like my new dress? Mama says the color is just right with my hair. See my bow? I like my hair better this way. Charles. Dolly, come here and sit on Dad's lap. Your hair is always beautiful, like rivers of black gold. I could drown in it. Maggie. Daddy, Daddy, I have a surprise for you. Daddy, listen to me. I know a whole poem. I'm going to say it for you. Daddy, you were gone so long this time. I miss you, Daddy. I want to say my poem. Charles. Maggie, my butterfly, give your old dad a hug and then you can say your poem. Have you been a good girl for Mama? Come, little buzzy bee, I'm your sunflower. Come sit me and promise not to sting. Maggie, oh, Daddy, climbing on his lap and kissing him with loud smacks while Dolly continues to sit there in disdain. Dolly, Maggie, stop pushing. Honestly, you're such a flit. Look at your hands. Don't you dare touch my new dress. Maggie grins and touches Dolly's dress. Papa, make her stop. Charles, oh, my pretties, you do your old dad's heart good. Sarah Jane, watching from the shadows. Dad. Charles. Okay, loveys, hop off. I haven't seen your mom yet. How is she? Maggie. Oh, Daddy, she's tired. She's always tired. Charles. Where is she, Dolly? In her room? Dolly. She's probably asleep, Papa. Stay with us. Sarah Jane. Dad. 
Maggie grabs Charles' hand and tries to pull him back down. Charles, let go, Maggie. Oh, Sarah, there you are. Did you want something? I'm just going to see your mother. Sarah Jane, never mind, Dad. It's nothing. Charles, okay, are you all right? You look a little peaked. Sarah Jane, yeah, sure, I'm okay. Maggie and Dolly, standing by Charles, appear to be almost as tall as he is. Dolly looking composed and dignified, her angular good looks a perfect feminine compliment to his hearty handsomeness. Maggie enchanting with her classic features and sprightly manner. Sarah Jane watches them as if they were characters in a play that has no part for her. She is short, chubby, plain. Maggie, yeah, yeah, fish lips, you're so ugly you could stare down a hog. Sarah Jane grabs Maggie's cheeks and pinches them with her fingernails until she brings blood. Mom, Mom, I'm bleeding. Sarah Jane made me bleed again. End of soap opera. I really think, Jane, that a lot of what was wrong with Mom had to do with chemical imbalances. Oh, yeah, Will, I know it did. The problems I had with my pregnancies were diagnosed as hormonal imbalances. I'm sure Mom's problems were the same. After you were born, they called it an afterbirth psychosis, and back then they didn't know how to treat it. She went into shock on the delivery table, and Uncle Ted sent her to Chicago in an ambulance. She was there for months. That's when Annie Jo took care of Fanny and me. Who took care of me, Jane? I think Dad had a nurse. I really don't remember much about that time, Will, except how much I loved Auntie Jo. She took me to have my hair cut and told me I looked like Shirley Temple, and, Will, I've seen pictures of me then, and I was homely. Annie Jo told Carrie I was the most pitiful child she'd ever seen. Oh, come on, Jane. No, Will, true. I know I felt pitiful. And then, Will, and then Mom kept going back to the hospital. And then when she came home the last time, that was when she went out to the garage and shut the door and turned on the car. Oh, Willie, Willie. Namesake, you named me for yourself, and in my veins runs your blood, in my eyes dances your sight. I have my mother's bones, I say, to all who call me beautiful, but we both know my bones will never be as big as yours. I have my mother's hands, I think, when my hands refuse to obey, but my hands next to yours are small and insignificant. I have my mother's mouth, I know, as I look at pictures of us both and see the trembling there, the fearfulness, the hunger. You named me for yourself, and in my veins runs your blood. In my eyes dances your sight. You, Sarah Jane, feel the sorrows of my heart, the rapture of my body. You, Sarah Jane, know the depth of my abandonment, the spinning of my restlessness. To you I dedicate my search, to all our restless longing, to the emptiness that fills our souls, to the wounds that never heal and the scab we pick together. You named me for yourself, and in my veins runs your blood, in my eyes dances your sight. Oh, Sarah Jane, we have walked ravines of despair, mountain tops of delight. We have survived in our own stone way the death of spirit. I live that you may live. I speak that you may live. I pray that you still live and wait for me somewhere. You named me for yourself, and in my veins runs your blood. In my eyes dances your sight. I have come home, O oh mother, to my name. A dream from Jane's journal. The house was cold. I ran from room to room looking for her, but no one was there. I thought I heard her scream. The house was cold. The dark blue velvet drapes were drawn, the antique furniture covered with white sheets. No one lived in this house anymore. The house was empty. I kept hearing a scream, and I ran up both flights of stairs to the attic, but I couldn't find anyone. The attic was clean. All the beautiful junk I'd played with as a kid was all gone all the old taffeta dresses, all the scratchy phonograph records. 
The hardwood floor and whitewashed walls were silent, still as a mausoleum. Where was she? I thought I could hear her very far away, like her voice was coming from a well. I started looking through the closets, but they were vacant. Not even a stray hanger had been left behind. There wasn't a sign in this house that anyone had ever lived here. The tunnels. She must be in the tunnels. Will used to tease Fanny and me by telling us he knew secret hiding places we'd never find. Now I had to find them. I felt my way down the uneven wooden steps of the cellar and ran my hands along the crumbling brick walls until I found the room that used to be the coal cellar. Now I could hear her more clearly. I pushed my feet along the crack between the wall and the floor through the dust and plaster, sure that I'd made a rat, until I felt one of the bricks give way. I reached down and moved it aside and felt a small opening in the wall. I pulled other bricks out until the hole was large enough for me to go in. The tunnel was cold, wet and cold. I went in even though I was afraid. I knew she was in there. There was just enough room for me to crawl. I pulled myself along, forcing myself to go further and further while I panted for breath. Sweat dripped into my eyes even in the cold. I didn't hear her anymore, but I kept going anyway. I was sure I'd find her. The tunnel took a sharp turn to the right, and I knew if I kept going, there'd be no turning back. It was getting a little bit lighter. I could almost see. I remember wondering whether I was under the dining room or the kitchen. The light grew brighter. I could almost feel its warmth. It kept pulling me through the tunnel, although the tunnel grew longer and longer as I scooted along. I was getting tired and slowing down. The screaming had stopped, and I realized I was reluctant to come to the end. I kept pushing myself. Don't you want to go into the light? Don't you want to get out of here? Something was holding me back, but I took a deep breath and shook it off. The light was closer now, brighter. I felt like I was slogging in quicksand, but I kept going. As soon as I got to the end of the tunnel, I plunged out into the light. It hurt my eyes. I felt even more lost and frightened than I had in the tunnel. I put my hands over my eyes to help them adjust. Then, when I looked around, I could see what looked like a courtyard surrounded by a ring of trees. Everything looked shimmery, like heat rising from a pavement. The trees were dusty, the bricks of the courtyard brown and dry. I was thirsty, and as I looked around again, I saw what looked like a well in the center of the courtyard. As thirsty as I felt, I still didn't want to go over to that well. Slowly, I started walking across the baked bricks. The air was silent, leaden. When I got to the well and leaned over to see if there was any water, I saw her. The well was dry, and she lay in the bottom, broken. I could tell by the way her body was bent that she had gone in head first. I could almost see her diving. Now I screamed, but there was no one there to hear me. A session with Jane's therapist, John. Part of the problem, John, is that we never had a funeral. Dad had made arrangements for their bodies to be donated to medical science, a perfectly rational thing to do. In fact, I've done the same thing. But then he didn't have a funeral. He had a memorial service the following summer, all very nice and friendly and unemotional, a social gathering really having little to do with my mother. We chatted with old friends and everyone thought, oh, how nice, how civilized. But now I have no place to go where she is, no grave, no grieving. No wonder I can't lay her to rest. Would you like to have a funeral for her, Jane? Isn't it a little late? Never too late. If you could have a funeral for her right now, where would you go? How would you do it? Well, I think I'd have the funeral in Michigan. She loved Michigan. She died there. Who would you invite? Oh, everyone. Everyone who knew her, living and dead, all the relatives, only I'd have them be as they were before they started falling apart. I'd have them be like they were at my wedding when they went to meet Uncle Chick at the train station. They made signs that said, Chick the people's friend, and they all went down and put on a demonstration like he was a visiting politician. Chick thought they were crazy. Okay, Jane, you can do this any way you want to. Invite anyone you want to. Any way I want to, even if it does sound silly? Sure. Well, we're all at the cottage at the lake behind the cottage next to the woods. We're all gathering wildflowers in the orchard. White daisies, blue forget-me-nots, orange poppies, yellow buttercups, the little purple bell-shaped flowers, and green ferns. We're going to put them on the coffin. Oh, the coffin is made out of pine wood from the woods behind the cottage. Natural, unfinished, the wonderful knots making swirls all over the wood. 
We can't carry the coffin up the hill to the woods. What can we use? Look around. What do you see? The boat trailer. We always keep the boat trailer under the trees. We head toward the edge of the woods. Everyone is there, her brother and sisters and their spouses and kids, Dad Burns and Charity, Charity who died before I was born, and Dad's friends from his courtroom days. And everyone is happy, laughing like it's a celebration. We're smiling, the sunlight filtering through the trees, picking flowers, going for the boat trailer, talking and laughing and humming among ourselves. All the members of the Burns family were big and gorgeous. I can see the sunlight shining on their heads and their hair reflecting light like they had halos. Now what's happening? We get the boat trailer, bring it to the back door, and put the coffin on it. Perfect. Now Dad goes to the front of the trailer and grabs the tongue, and Will and Fanny and I go with him. Everyone else is laying flowers on the coffin, smiling and chatting. Then Mom's sisters and brother get around the sides and back of the trailer and push, and we start to move up the bridle path through the woods. We're singing, but I can't hear what the song is. Listen, Jane. Oh, John, it's that creaky old hymn I've been hearing in my head so much lately. Open my eyes that I may see Glimpses of truth thou hast for me Place in my hands the wonderful key that shall unclasp and set me free. Why would I remember that? Mom hated hymns. She hated church. She liked Christmas carols, though. Maybe we ought to sing Joy to the World. Sing whatever you like. Now the path is starting to get steep. We all dig in and heave. The path is rough here, and there's a dead birch tree fallen across the path, its white skin puckered like an old man's. We stop, and the others pick up the log and move it aside. We're sweating a little now, and the woods are silent, except for the birds talking to each other. This is my favorite part of the woods. The tree here are so tall, the sunlight never touches the floor. The trunks grow straight up and bare until they burst into foliage like a crown just at the top. It's dark, moist, quiet, like a church should be and never is. We stop again and stand in silence for a few moments, everyone looking up at the tiny patch of sky far above. We feel refreshed and start pulling and pushing up the path again. We're almost to the meadow. There's just one more rocky patch of road and then we'll be there. The meadow is beautiful now, filled with wild roses and raspberry bushes. Everything looks pink and smells pink. We bring the trailer in slowly while I look for just the right place. There, there, right under the raspberry bushes, just at the edge of the line of trees, right over there. The branches of the trees make an archway into the woods. It looks like a gothic door. We lift her off the boat trailer and slide her in the little door into the trees. We pick some wild roses and add them to the flowers already on the coffin. It feels a little cold in her crypt and I shiver. We come out into the sun and bow our heads and feel the warmth on our necks. No one speaks. I am content. Now, I'll read a few selections from um, part three of the novel. Um, remember that uh, Jane is writing to her lover, Miguel, who is in Spain writing his novel. And Jane has gone to, to Michigan, where she's teaching herself Spanish. And she is, she's writing the poem directly to Miguel, and while she is learning the Spanish, she's, she writes some stanzas of the uh, poem in Spanish. Now, as I read, I won't stop to translate any of the sections in Spanish except the last stanza, which is the end of the poem and the end of the novel. The Way Home for Miguel. My fingers hunger to taste your face, to explore the map of your body. Tocar el ánimo de tu canto, my fingers never get enough to eat. Even while a child, my hungers consumed me. I wanted to walk the world. My Magellan legs and curious mind rebelled against direction, wanted to find their own way. My feet were bound to keep 
them tamed. They have never learned to walk and now only know how to run, to run. The man wears a black hat trimmed in silver. Tattooed arms speak prison or the Navy. Tobacco face crinkles at his companion's joke. His agate eyes dead still. Tanned hand shifts coffee cup and cigarette, precise as a machine. His companion smiles and brings me coffee. The water weeps, where are you? I never saw my mother cry. I never watched her legs dance. I never heard her voice sing. I never felt her body warm. Poison was her only food, bones her only beauty, death her only desire. Did her famished spirit ever drink? Did her hungers ever feed? I came to you with empty hands, and you sent me away full. No pedi nada y me diste todo. I missed the feast of tasting and touching that lingers on my skin long after the explosion of passion. I want to smell you on my fingers for days, savor you on my tongue for weeks. I want to travel so deep in you I come back foreign. Yo lloro en la lluvia, el cielo lleve mis lágrimas. Juntos inundamos el mundo. Yo floresco en las flores, la tierra florece mi fragrancia. Juntos avivamos el mundo. Yo creo en la creación, mi obra me crea. Juntos inventamos la creencia. When we lived in California, I wore flowers in my hair, camellias perfect and cold as wax grew wild beside our door. Everything is too perfect in California, hothouse, forced. Nothing has the substance of Nebraska wind. You, pilgrim Jew, know your heritage. Your legacy is written in blood. Your eyes can see that long red line. Your fingers trace it like a map. Where, sweet Jesus, is my heritage? Buried beneath an unmarked stone. Buried where even God's fingers cannot go. All my people are dead. All those big, beautiful folk who towered over me while I was growing up. All my people are dead. Will said, I never realized what a small man dad was until I carried him when he was dying. Dad always seemed as huge to me as the great white birches behind the cottage, as strong and as enduring. All my people are dead. Now I'm supposed to be the birches, strong and enduring for my children. Instead, I am the willow branch, bending and bowing in every wind. My children are the birches. The woods wail, don't leave me. The water weeps, where are you? I felt my mother's hand on my brow, felt her bones and beating veins, her rings too loose and turning on her slender, fleshless fingers, and I was soothed. He said, your hands are so small, you must be a blue blood. Only aristocrats have hands like yours. I said, they're not good for anything. I remember my hands covered with blisters when I became a bride. I had never cooked before, and every time my hands went in the oven, they came out burned. I remember my hands raw as new-cut beef when I became a mother. They went from scrub bucket to washing machine to dirty toilets to washing dishes to bathing babies, never out of water. They should have been fish. I remember my hands shaking thermometers filling vaporizers, feeling foreheads, rubbing backs, soothing hurts, holding babies all night long, praying to a timid God. I remember my hands touching tiny feet, stroking tender skin, tracing lines on smooth skin, grasping needy little hands, reaching out for falling bodies, crying when they slipped right through. He said, your fingers are gorgeous, long and thin. They look so sensitive. I said, I never thought they were good for anything. 
the mother wears a crown of roses trimmed in thorns. Hair silver as pigeon's wing swoops around her cracked face. Porcelain hands orchestrate the air, shot glass and cigarette a counterpoint, ragged voice a dissonance. She smiles and pours another drink. Her eyes bleed. You left your garden growing green for my picking, your lilacs purple with perfume, your strawberries dripping red juice down my chin. You left me full, full, warmed by your music, your candlelight, your body on brass. You left me empty, empty, naked as your floors, hollow as your house, cold as your voice on the telephone. His skin was lead, dead as my guts. His body was rope, taut as my thoughts. His eyes were quartz, hard as my heart. He gave me orange orgasms and a violet distaste for myself. When my second spring came, I bloomed with a fierceness unknown by my first fresh spring. I am poppies, snapdragons, iris, not violets, trillium, lilies. I am Lake Michigan storm purple, not cold brook, angel pure. He wrote, you put me in mind of the rising up and greening of the great Midwest after the ice age. The rich black earth of Illinois is dry and crusty this year. The farmer plowing blows dust all over the highway. I roll my window up to keep from choking and remember wet, steamy cornfields, tassels brushing my face ears tender enough to eat, and the sound of corn growing all night long. Oh, I have created myself. I am my own mother. Mother's hard, bony body was my first home. Is that why I travel, searching hungrily through the angles and planes of men's bodies, hunting for my lost home? I looked at Dad that fateful summer and saw death in his face. Two weeks later, he had his heart attack. This morning, I looked in the mirror and saw death. Dejaste caer una guija en mis entrañas y cayó, tocando todos los hoyos, hondos, vacíos y huecos que yo no había escuchado nunca. Tu piedra sigue, sigue cayendo, buscando sin fin, perdiendo la pesadumbre, ganando una luminosa ligera. Mis tormentas no me atormentan ya, no más. The rain sighs, no more, no more, no more. This year when I stroll down the road, mosquitoes devour me like piranhas. Flocks of geese let me walk up to them and primp while I take their picture. This year, dandelions and mustard split the beach rocks. Lilacs come purple before cherry blossoms go green. This year, I wade the three-mile shoreline from Frankfurt to Point Betsy and never get my knees wet. I picnic on the assembly beach and never see another soul. This year, the crows are huge black hawks. The hills are engravings etched in emerald ice. This year, lilies of the valley try to climb the white birches, forget-me-nots nearly uproot the blue spruce. This year, the car fairies slumber in the harbor, still and ponderous as sleeping bear dune. The harbor water looks clean enough to drink. This year, the seagulls hang suspended so long above the water, my blood ebbs before they plunge. The dun green water shades into purple so fast, my eyes lose the race. This year, I cook chicken. Smothered in whiskey and sprinkled with rosemary, I broil whitefish seasoned with leeks. This year, the poppies in the orchard are fierce orange jack-o'-lanterns. The myrtle blooms bluer than the water, bluer than the sky. This year, I roll in strawberry beds all night, their pungent scent mingling with my ripeness. This year, my green growth explodes with the fresh, tender trees. My fertile earth nurtures breathtaking blossoms. May and see me, may.
y encontré un pozo. Bebí y me satisfice. Me lavé y renací. Navegué y me descubrí a mí misma. Hallé mi hogar en mí. I traveled deep inside myself and found a well. I drank and was satisfied. I washed and was reborn. I sailed and discovered myself within myself, found my home within myself.